All right, so without, uh, without further ado, I will introduce Patrick. We've got Patrick online, is that right? Let me go one, there we go, look at that. They already took the control away from me, so I can't mess it up. Um, Patrick, most of you know Patrick or have heard from him in the past. He's one of my favorite economists. He does a fantastic job. Just a brief, brief introduction of Patrick. He is the Senior Vice President of Research at Greater Houston Partnership. He oversees research and development, which provides data analysis, forecasting functions, all for the partnership. He's worked at the Greater Houston Partnership um, and its predecessor, which was the, the Houston Chamber of Commerce for 36 years. Um, and he's about as good as it gets. And we're really pleased to have him here today and really interested to hear what he has to say one year later after he spoke to us just prior to uh, the outbreak and, and shutdown. So with that, I will turn it over to Patrick. See if they can pull him up. So let's uh, round of applause for Patrick Jankowski. Well, I wanna thank you very much, Chad, for, for having me back. Uh, and Brenda, it's good to see you again. I wish I had a chance to visit with you in person. Uh, lovely facility you have out there. I think last year, you guys were the very last real presentation I made, in-person presentation. And I think we shut it down uh, at the partnership's office just right about then. It has been one crazy year for sure. But what's amazing is it looks like uh, we're going to start opening up soon. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if most people are back to normal operations uh, by early summer, definitely by late summer. But a lot of that depends upon how well the, the vaccinations go and uh, social distancing and all the other things that need to fall in place to make sure that we can all gather back together. But let me go ahead and get started with my, my presentation. Uh, there's a date on the calendar that economists like me just absolutely love. And that's the third Friday, that's the 19th of March. And it was, it was a great day, it really was. I, I, we celebrated that day and you wonder, well, what's so great about the 19th of March? Well, you know, it was Bob Dylan's first album came out back in 62. Uh, Glenn Close's birthday was in March 19th. Uh, you go back to the, the 60s and John Lennon and Yoko Ono got married on March 19th. But for nerds like me, uh, March 19th has a, a, a higher significance and that's when we had this thing come out, something referred to as the benchmark revisions. We got revisions to all the employment data for the last 21 months and uh, some minor revisions even further back than that. Now you wonder, well, what, what's the big deal? What, why are you so excited about revisions? We well, need to understand when we get our monthly reports on the data, they are not getting it from any sort of administrative record. What's happening is the, the Bureau of Labor Statistics and the Texas Workforce Commission are actually doing a survey. In essence, what they're doing is they're, they're polling employers. Uh, they, they, there are uh, six, seven million employers across the US. They only poll about 60,000 of them. You know, they have multiple locations. And they use that polling data, they use it survey, you know, the more scientific term is survey. They use that survey data to come up with estimates of what's actually going on in the economy. And then what they do is they start looking at actual administrative data starting in the fall to come up with actually what happens. So it's, it's, I kind of liken it to uh, you know coming up to the election, there are all these pollsters out there and they call people up on the phone or they stand on the street corner and they take polls of which likely way are people gonna vote. And based on those polls, we have some idea of what the outcome for the election will be. It's kind of the same thing with the way the Texas Workforce Commission and the BLS does their surveys. You know, they, they're, they, they try as hard as they can to get it right. And they give us some idea of the direction it's heading with the economy. But it isn't until they get those revisions that we know exactly what happened. And, and what they actually look at for the revisions is if you are an employer and you have one employee, any state in the US, you have to pay unemployment insurance. And you have to file those records on a timely basis. And what happens is BLS and TWC gathers the information that they can for the unemployment insurance records, meaning how many people were covered by a policy this month versus last month. And they come up with a new set of data to figure out how many people were laid off between each month and how many were laid off by industry and how many were laid off over the course of the pandemic. Well, you can see they actually did a pretty good job with their poll or their survey. Uh, the, the initial pandemic losses, they were worse than first reported. The initial estimate that was we lost 350,000 jobs. 
in March and April. Based on that revised data, uh, we lost 361. Yeah, it's only off by about 11,000 in an economy with 3.2 million jobs. That's pretty good. You know, maybe I'm focusing too much on how accurate they were with their survey. We need to focus on that revised loss. This region, the Houston region, the nine counties, Austin and Brazoria, Chambers, Fort Bend, Galveston, Harris, Liberty, Montgomery and Waller counties, those nine counties as a group lost over 360,000 jobs in just two months in March and April of last year. I'll kind of put that in perspective. Now, uh, Chad said that I've been with the partnership for 36 years. I, I cut my teeth on the 80s oil bust back in the 80s. Uh, and I remember that one very well. And then we all probably remember the Great Recession. No matter how old we are, we probably remember the Great Recession that took place in 08 and 09. The job losses that we suffered, that Houston suffered in the pandemic were worse than the oil bust and the Great Recession combined. Give you some idea, just the order of magnitude of the losses, just absolutely horrific losses. One of the things that we also, we found out when we get the data is it gets revised backwards, uh, very heavy revisions for 21 months and then lighter revisions beyond that up to 10 years is we found out that several key sectors in the Houston region, employment peaked, so activity in those sectors peaked well before the pandemic began. Oil and gas, the, the exploration and production side and the oil flow service side, peaked in February of 2019. So think about that, one of our key sectors, oil and gas sector peaked, actually peaked two years ago. Manufacturing and manufacturing is very heavily tied to oil and gas, whether it's manufacturing of oil fluid equipment or manufacturing of pipes, valves, planges, pressure vessels, the sort of stuff that you guys use along the ship channel, that, that peaked in July and then construction peaked in October. So if you look at this, the fact that we had these three key sectors of our economy and they peaked prior to the pandemic, they peaked before we went into the pandemic, we were already softening prior to the pandemic. You know, they, if you look at the data originally, we thought we created about 62,000 jobs in 2019, which is normal. This region creates between 60 and 70,000 jobs a year. We actually only created 54,000 jobs. Now we were getting growth in some other areas while oil and gas and manufacturing and construction were suffering. But we entered the pandemic already in a weakened state. To give you some idea of how, how many jobs we lost, uh, 14,000 in oil and gas, almost 34,000 in manufacturing, 43,6 in construction, that comes up to 91,000 jobs. And if you think about it, those losses are starting the approach, those three sectors are approaching the total losses that we had in the Great Recession. And the thing is, if you look at those sectors from the most recent data we had, all three of them were still losing jobs. Uh, the oil and gas losses are concentrated in the white collar side and the office jobs, uh, the geologists and the engineers are still getting laid off. Manufacturing very heavily concentrated in oil field equipment, pipes, valves, flanges, things of that nature. Construction has been across the board. We're seeing the job losses. And this is what economists refer to as the goods producing sector. It is a key component of our economy. And the fact that it is so weak right now is something that really concerns me. Uh, another thing we found when we got the revisions back is that TWC consistently overestimated the strength of the recovery in Houston. Uh, the, the green bars are when we added jobs, the red bars are when we lost jobs. Uh, you can see if you, if you look at the losses in March, they were, they were dead on there, but they uh, underestimated in April. And as you go across, you can see they kind of underestimated the growth in every, every month. July is kind of an odd character, because with July, uh, we always lose jobs in July, and that's because uh, Brenda probably knows this. Uh, there are a lot of educators or people who support the educational industry uh, are on nine-month or ten-month contracts, and they're unemployed briefly during the summer before they go back on the roll. So we always lose about eighteen to twenty thousand jobs in the summer. This year, we had losses laid on top of that. If you remember, we were opening up the economy. Governor Abbott, we had bars had were opening at partial capacity and restaurants were up to 75%. And then we had one of those initial surges. And then Governor Abbott said, whoa, bars have to close back down. Restaurants, you have to go back to 50%. We saw a loss of 5,000 restaurant jobs just because of that scaling back. 
Plus we saw those additional losses. We saw some significant losses in oil and gas and construction and manufacturing because that's the, how the, they started finally showing up, the losses, the, the things that were taking place in April and May started showing up in the July data. But you can look and see the fact that, that they underestimated the losses and overestimated the gains. Excuse me one second, I'm gonna take a sip of Ozarka. It means we recovered uh, about 49,000 jobs fewer than we first thought. Uh, another way to put that is we are not as far along in the recovery as we thought we were back in December. Uh, some sectors did very well in spite of the pandemic. Uh, food and beverage stores, building supply stores, general merchandise stores. You know, food and beverage stores, grocery stores, they did well in March and April because everybody was panic buying. Uh, they also did well because all the restaurants were shut down or they were limited to takeaway, so more people were eating at home. And it put a, uh, filled the aisles or emptied the shelves in the grocery stores. Building supply stores, two components there. Part of it is this incredible surge we've had in home building in the Houston region. But also when people weren't reporting to work or when they were working remotely or, or they weren't able to take that vacation, you know, they finally had time to work on those long promised remodeling projects at home. And that kind of drove the demand for building supplies. General merchandise stores, that's gonna be Walmart and Target and Dollar General and, and, and so forth. Uh, those stores did well because you had, uh, the consumer realized they could go to Target and, and buy their, their 20 pack of toilet paper, their bottled water, their Lysol wipes, their board games, their fresh fruit, everything they needed in one place so they could get in and out quickly. So that explains why those did well. A couple have already recovered. Uh, insurance didn't lose very many jobs, nor did computer systems and design. So they recovered quickly. Transportation and warehousing is a little bit misleading because if you look at aviation, if you look at trucking, those sectors are still losing jobs. But with all this online shopping, we saw warehouses in Houston fill up and we saw a greater demand for courier services, so FedEx and DHL and package delivery. And the job gains in those sectors offset the losses in places like aviation and, and rail and, and trucking. Uh, some sectors fared worse than first reported. You can see retail trade. Uh, I was skeptical of the retail trade numbers all along. I couldn't believe it was shut down retail to the extent we had that we only lost 27,000 jobs, actually lost 40,000 jobs. Professional scientific and technical services, uh, that's going to be accounting and legal and engineering and that computer design and public relations and uh, uh, management consulting. Uh, early on in the pandemic, everybody assumed, well, these are the sort of things where you don't have to interact with the client face to face. You can do that over Zoom. You know, people can, can sit at home on their couch or at their dining table or their home office and can still uh, design plans and, and, and handle legal documents and so forth. And the belief was because those professions were the sort of things that could be done remotely that didn't demand a direct face-to-face -face interaction with the client, they were faring well. What everyone missed was the fact that if the energy industry was like, if everyone else was laying someone off and they were looking for ways to cut costs, they're gonna scale back on their professional contracts. They're not gonna engage as many lawyers or accountants and, or spend as much on advertising. So that suffered. Administrative support, two big categories there. One is janitorial services. No one's in the office. The office doesn't need to be cleaned. Also contract workers. If you're in the middle of recession, first people you let go are your contract workers and you try to hold on to your full-time uh, workforce. Other services, that's where uh, barbershops, beauty salons, nail salons fall into that. Even auto repair falls in that. Uh, a lot fewer accidents were being reported because there's a lot less traffic on the road and what traffic there was, there was no congestion. So all those sort of things that came into play there. So uh, if you want to look at where we are, what sectors have, uh, how many jobs we still need to recoup, you can look there and you can see construction. I mean, I'll let you guys know that is a real worry of mine that we are down close to 40,000 jobs in construction. It's like one in every six jobs in, in construction has been lost over the last two years. Professional and business services, that includes both those uh, accounting and legal and the, the, the white collar plus the janitorial and, and things like that. Restaurants and bars, manufacturing and so forth, you can go along. Uh, finance will probably recover pretty quickly, but you can look, uh, just every one of those sectors has uh, not a few hundred, but a few thousand jobs to recover. Uh, 
the good thing is, is there is some pent up demand out there. And I think job growth is going to be fairly strong. And I'll talk about that in a moment. Now, one thing which kind of threw the numbers off was, is we always lose jobs in January. It's just, uh, you can you can count on that. Uh, you can take that to the bank, to use that expression. A couple of things that are happening there. Uh, one thing is we have a lot of hiring in October, September, October, November, December for the Christmas holidays. Think about the extra retail workers that are brought on in the stores. We have hiring in the restaurants and bars and the hotels for all the parties that go on. You get a surge in, in the hiring through employment agencies of contract workers because they're companies that have December 31st deadlines on contracts they need to deal with. And you also have people who, who uh, you have companies that go through reorganization plans and they just don't have the heart to lay people off before Thanksgiving or Christmas. And so what happens come January, the seasonal workers are let go and those layoff decisions that were made the first week of November or the end of October, uh, those are implemented in January. And that's the reason why we always have those sort of layoffs. And so that gives you, if you go over here to this far right hand side, you can see we lost an additional close to 48,000 jobs. And that's one of the things that added to the, the loss that we need to make up. Now you can kind of look at this chart right here and you can see what's happened in Houston over time. It, it's kind of jagged, you know, there's really deep dips. Those are those January dips I just talked to you about. The shallow dips are those July dips, but you can look and see, and you can see just how far down employment fell in the region, this improvement, you can see this drop in January, July, this improvement and this drop in January. But you can just trace this all the way back over to here. And you're looking at Houston as the region has pretty much given up all the jobs that it's created since the end of the fracking boom. We basically lost the equivalent of six years worth of job growth because of the pandemic. And we're, we'll start, we're starting to get those back, but it's not gonna be quite as easy as it was after the Great Recession, and I'll talk about that later on. Uh, we see it also in this, this is data which is put together by some economists at Harvard University, and they, they post it for all the met major metropolitan areas in the US. And they look at it a little bit differently, and not just by industry, but by occupations and what they pay. And it's showing that uh, of all the occupations out there, the low wage ones, those making less than 27,000, think about that, that's your, that's your classic retail worker, your restaurant worker has suffered the most, but uh, even the, the higher wage jobs, the engineers and accounting and so forth are struggling. And you can see the middle wage jobs. So, so how long is it gonna take for us to get to a full recovery? How long is it gonna take for us to get back to where we were uh, prior to the pandemic? Well, there I've kind of summarized where we are in our losses. You can look and see that the region we lost 361,000. The gains made in December were 164,000. But you have to subtract from that the 47,900 jobs we lost in January. So that puts us with a gap to close of about 244,000 jobs. So, so roughly we've only recouped about a third of what we've lost. We've got two thirds left to go. And that's to get us back to, to February levels. You know, the the, the 244.4 or the 244,400, that's kind of a mouthful to remember. Just let this stick with you. Houston is a quarter of a million jobs shy of where it should be. Actually, if you consider what we gave, there was no growth. You know, if we would have kept on growing, we would be even further along. But I'm not going to I'm not going to confuse it too much. Just Houston is still 250,000 jobs, quarter of a million jobs shorter where we should be. Now there's conversation out about there uh, among some local economists. We're all, we're all having discussions about what do we expect job growth to be like? And we're really expecting there to be some pent up demand this year. There are a lot of people who have not had a vacation in over a year, uh, me included. Uh, a lot of people who are anxious to go out to eat with their friends, uh, people who are, are wanting to, to make some big ticket purchases. But all those decisions have been put on hold until you know, we get to where it's safe to travel, safe to go out in public, and people feel just a little bit more secure in their jobs. And so what's gonna happen at some point, we're gonna reach that, that point of herd immunity, that point where everyone feels comfortable, and we're gonna start to see all that pent up demand released. I mean, for example, the cruise lines are really struggling right now because no one wants to go on a cruise. I mean, the cruise can't, lines can't go. 
because the Center for Disease Control has pretty much put them in port. But I promise you that when things do finally get better, you're going to see at some point, maybe initially reluctance because people are a little bit worried about a, a, another surge. But at some point, you'll see lots of people traveling. You'll see lots of people flying. You'll see lots of people going to the restaurants. It's kind of like you know, cabin fever. You've, we've been locked up for so long or locked down for so long that when we finally get the all, it's all okay to come out, come out of our houses, it's all okay to go out and, and go to the restaurants and party again. You're gonna see an initial surge and then you'll see it settle back down. That, that initial surge is one of the reasons why there are discussions among economists about whether we're gonna have inflation this year. And there'll probably be some initial inflation as all this pent up demand is released and we're competing with each other for seats at the table, but then it'll settle back down. But I, I'm digressing a little bit. Uh, there is this discussion among economists that they think that we might create 100,000 jobs this year. Job growth would be anywhere between 3% and 4%. Now, 3% job growth would put us about 90,000 jobs. 4% job growth would put us at about 120,000 jobs. Uh, but I'm going back to that time that I, I talked to you about. Uh, we need to create about 250,000 jobs to bring us back to where we were. And you can see, uh, there are times when we have created 250,000 jobs. If you look at this, we've never had two years back to back where we created 100 or 120,000 jobs. It's easy if we have a year of 120,000 jobs, it's usually something substantially less, slightly less or substantially less. But you can look when we were coming out of that awful, awful oil bust in the 80s, we had three years we created 254,000 jobs. If you look after the, the kind of the doldrums of the, the mid part of the 90s, period of 251,000, uh, just before the Great Recession, almost 300,000, and then the early part of the last decade, 324,000. So you know, part of what I'm showing you is that it will take at least three years for us to get back the 250,000 jobs that we're missing. Even if you say that, okay, we're going to create 120,000 jobs this year, I, I'm skeptical. There are a lot of people out there. Some people out there who say we will. Uh, if we created 120,000 jobs this year, that still leaves us 120,000, 130,000 jobs to create in 2022. Normal job growth is 60 to 70,000 jobs a year. Uh, even if we created 100,000 jobs this year, 100,000 jobs next year, that still leaves us with another 50,000 jobs we're gonna to need to create. But there's something you need to understand about these, these periods in Houston's past history where we've been able, we've managed to create 250,000 jobs. And there were things going on which fed that growth. I mean, in the 80s, it was Compaq. Uh, those of us have been around for a while, remember Compaq was uh, deemed the first company, to, uh, the fastest company to ever go from startup to making the Fortune 500. And Compaq went from a few years having a few hundred employees to at one time having 18,000 employees in Houston. And that's when Houston was much smaller. But you can look and see in the, the late 90s, we had this surge in activity and that's also associated with the dot-com bubble. Uh, we had, yeah, we had some great growth in 05, 06, and 07, but there was a housing bubble underway then. And that incredible growth that we had in the early part of the last decade, that was during the fracking boom. Now, uh, oil and gas isn't going to come back to the same extent it, it did in, in the last decade, and I'm concerned it may never come back. Uh, we've benefited an awful lot from what was going on in the Eagleford Shell, and that's not, going to, that's not going to be repeated. If anything, we'll be lucky if oil and gas stays flat, and we're not going to see, and we don't want growth fueled by something like a housing bubble or a dot-com bubble. So yeah, we're going to grow, but we're not going to be growing at rates of 100,000 jobs, maybe one year, but after one year, after we released all that pent up demand, we're not gonna to continue to see growth at that rate. So the question is, the question comes, how soon before we get back to normal? Excuse me one second, I'll have another sip of Ozarka. How soon will we get back to normal? Uh, that's a site in front of the George R. Brown Convention Center in downtown Houston, if uh, you guys don't recognize, that's Discovery Green leaning up to it. Well, one thing is we're trying real hard to get there. Uh, Governor Abbott lifted the mask mandate. Uh, Houston, Texas is open. I mean, he's open Texas 100%. Although when I go out and about, when I, when I go to the grocery store or the hardware store or 
to pick up food at a at a restaurant, I still see probably 95% of the people out there still wearing masks. So people are trying to get back to the normal activity, but they're still a little bit cautious. If you want to see what's actually been happening in Texas, uh, some of the data which supports what Abbott was trying to do is, uh, you know, we've had an enormous number of cases, 2.7 million. That's like saying one in every 10 Texans has come down with the, the COVID virus, nearly 48,000 deaths. These are numbers as of, of, of early this week. Uh, but if you look at the rate of cases, it's trending down. If you look at the rate of deaths, it's trending down. If you look at the rate of hospitalizations, trending down. So we are headed in the right direction. Uh, you can look at it here. This is a, this kind of shows you the trend line. And you can see that COVID cases in Texas actually peaked uh, mid-January. And think about that, that peak in mid-January, that's just two weeks after the holiday season. And so it's kind of the, the spike we expected to see as everybody gathered close together for Christmas get-togethers and holiday parties and so forth. Uh, it did lead to the spread of the virus. But you can see how far the cases have fallen. And you go back from uh, an average of 22, 23,000 cases uh, a day to an average of uh, 3,500 cases a day. So that's what, eight or nine times fewer than we had earlier. So we're trending in the right direction, which is a good sign. Uh, this is data from the Texas Medical Center. I know it's a real busy graph and hard to read. You don't need to focus too much on those individual numbers, but what you want to see is how we are coming down from the peak again a bit of a concern because we've plateaued and this plateau here is a bit higher than this plateau here, but we are headed in the right direction as far as the number of, of cases that we're seeing in the Houston area. And you can see this, this is another one of those really busy graphs, but it's got, a, it's got some insight into it. If you look at it, the number of hospitalizations and you follow this red line and the trend line is the number of hospitalizations for COVID are on their way down. And this is just February and March. You go down and you read it on the bottom and you can see the, the spike related to that uh, earlier graph and it's trending down. So we're, we're headed in the right direction. So that really gives me hope, sometimes hope, because the, the big thing that's gonna help us out, well, the, the, the stimulus package has helped us out. I could talk a whole hour on that, but also this the sense that things are getting better and it's safer to go out and this release of pent up demand. And so, so how close are we to hitting this sort of herd immunity? It's kind of like a, the, the referee's blown the whistle or the umpire said play ball or the tip off uh, at center court. And how close are we to getting there? Well, this gives you some idea where we are on, on vaccinations. These are first shots given. I wasn't able to find really good data on by county on second shots or, or, or fully vaccinated. But you can look and see there that uh, whether you live in a rural county, the rural counties aren't doing quite as well as some of the other more urban counties, but you can look and see Fort Bend and Galveston, a third of the adults have gotten the shot and we're approaching, you know, we're halfway to that initial stage of herd immunity. Um, and I did the research and depends upon who you talk to, what journal you read, uh, herd immunity is at 70%. Some people say no, it needs to be at 80%. I think once we get close to 70%, you're probably going to see people really let down their guard and relax a lot. But the point I'm trying to show you is that we have made great progress for reaching herd immunity. But uh, the partnership still, my employer, the ally of you guys out there, Chad, we still are asking people to wear their mask and limit crowds because uh, we really want to get this uh, as many people vaccinated as possible and get herd immunity and not have a second surge and have to scale back operations. So, so let's talk a little bit about Houston's economy. And, and what we see going on. Uh, oil, very important, <laughs> obviously. So I can't talk to a crowd, I can't talk to an audience in Houston without having at least one chart showing the price of oil. I mean, it is, it, it is uh, if I don't have a chart on the price of oil, I'll have someone come to me afterwards and say, you didn't say anything about oil. So, but you can look and see what we saw. This is a West Texas Intermediate spot price, monthly price. You can see the, uh, that April is the average for April. Yes, we all remember the headlines and when briefly on one day, oil traded at a, a negative value. Uh, but what's more important is, is the spot price. Uh, this does pose a bit of a challenge, uh, although we see this wonderful price, this, this average in, in March is, is asterisk because it's just through the first two weeks of March. 
spot prices are up, but you need to understand oil and gas companies don't sell all their crude on the, on the spot market. What they do is they, they contract for it, or the term in the industry, they hedge their production. And they say contracts in December or early January with somebody and the, the other party agrees to take a certain quantity of oil at a fixed price. And there are a lot of companies out there that hedged their production, that hedged the equivalent to 50% of their production out of a price of around $45 a barrel. So they guaranteed themselves on the downside, but they lost the potential for the upside. Now that other 50%, they're able to spell, sell on the spot market and, and reap some of the profits on that. But it, it isn't as universal a benefit to them as if they were trying to sell it all on the spot market. Of course, they put, they put their financials greatly at risk. And because so much of this production is hedged, and another factor coming into play is that the capital markets have, have just about shut down for the oil and gas industry. They don't want to lend to the oil and gas industry because the, the returns have been so poorly. And they're having to fund it out of cash flow. And that's one reason why you're not seeing the rig count go up as much as you would expect when you see oil above $60 a barrel. At 411 rigs, we are just barely above we were at the worst part of the fracking bust. It's because the companies are having to fund it out of cash flow. And you know, part of that cash flow is already hedged. And they're being paid now, or they're, the stockholders are demanding profitab profitability, not growth in production. Now, and the weak rig count, then that plays back into uh, manufacturing employment. Because if you have fewer rigs working or, or the rig count hasn't picked up, there's still not the demand for oil field equipment. And you can even say the same thing for wholesale trade, because a lot of stuff is sold to the oil and gas out of the wholesale dealers. And even transportation, trucking, because if you sell something in Houston, it's manufacturing in Houston, you have to get it out to the, the Permian oil field. So good news is gasoline, especially along the ship channel, gasoline prices are, are, are going up. Uh, they had a dollar eighty-eight at the worst part of the pandemic last year. It's uh, this is the average retail monthly retail price for gasoline in the U.S. Uh, the average is two fifty, I think. I've seen it at some pumps around town, a little bit of three dollars, uh, which is hopefully uh, going to help uh, improve some of the margins there for the refiners. Uh, and we're seeing an improvement in, in Gulf Coast refining utilization. I've, Got it going back to 2014, and I thought it was interesting. If you look at what happened with Hurricane Harvey, and you can see the, the operable uh, refining capacity utilization, how it dropped to about 60% uh, the week of Harvey and the week afterwards, you can see the impact that COVID had, and that's because no one was driving anywhere. There was no demand. And then look what happened with the big freeze of a month ago when couldn't get workers there, couldn't get worried about, couldn't get the workers to the plants, and then couldn't get uh, crude into the refineries and, and so forth. Uh, and so we have recovered uh, from the big freeze. And actually, you can tell we are off the bottom from COVID, but we're still below where we were, uh, still below 80. Uh, industry really likes it when it's above 90, but if we can get even a, uh, to the mid 80s or upper 80s, that would be good. And volume of exports of chemicals. Uh, this is interesting. You can see this is a 12 month moving total. So each one of those little points there represents uh, the, the total over the last 12 months. And you can see this nice ramp up in the amount of chemicals that we were exporting. And you can see a little bit of a plateau here, which occurred in the pandemic. And we started to pick up and this reflects just a little bit of the freeze. And so we're exporting more chemicals volume wise now than we ever had before from, from this region. The problem is, is with prices, and, and although the, the volume of chemicals is up, uh, the value of those exports is down. And part of that challenge is, frankly, uh, we're overbuilt. And so there's pressure on prices. And we'll, that'll probably be that way for the next two to three years. And also the weak global economy. And a lot of this is, you know, for this part here is overbuilding. And, and then you get to here and it's the weak global economy. But the good news is if you look at just uh, one month, doesn't make a data point, doesn't make a trend. It is a data point, it doesn't make a trend. We did start to see some improvement in, in the value of, of chemical exports and volume of chemical exports in January. But it's almost too soon to, to say anything uh, more than that. So let's shift a little bit about a broader text of the, in context of the economy, the Houston Purchasing Managers Index, P 
PMI, a survey of the purchasing managers around town asking them questions about production and employment, backlogs, prices paid, inventories. Uh, whatever this blue line is above the red line, that's a sign manufacturing activity in the region is expanding compared to the previous month. You can look and see that the PMI is showing that we are starting to see manufacturing expansion in the region. Now this, once again, that's, that's COVID. That right there is Hurricane Harvey. That's the fracking bus and that's the Great Recession. So you can look and see what COVID did to the PMI. Uh, don't normally show this, but you can look at, and I say that any, time, any, any value above 50 is good. This is the first time we've seen employment since uh, in the last 12 months, the first time we've seen employment above 50. So we are starting to see some job growth, a little bit in manufacturing, not get back to where it was pre-COVID, but we're starting to see a little bit of hiring there. Talk a little bit about home sales in the Houston region. Excuse me, one second, another sip of Ozarka. Record pace for home sales, 108,000 sold over the 12 months ending in, in February, 2021. Uh, it's just absolutely phenomenal that we're selling this many homes. The problem is, and you sit in this graph right here, we're running out of supply. In, in a normal market, uh, you wanna have about the equivalent of six months of supply on the market, meaning uh, based on the current inventory, current number of listings at the pace we are currently selling homes, when will supply be exhausted? Right now, we have about a 1.4 month supply of homes on the market. And so those are resale homes. And so uh, we're not gonna be able to keep up those paces because we just don't have the supply. And it's the same thing as even showing up in new home construction because the demand is so strong, we can only have enough lots or enough materials to keep up with that. So getting to the end, it's a little bit of an insight in construction. You can see residential is holding up well. Commercial is weak, non-building, and this is where civil construction and heavy industrial projects show up. And we've seen a little bit of an improvement. The light blue is year to date, this year versus last year. Bit of a concern though, if you think about uh, one of the first stage in a construction project is engage the architects. And the architects, this is similar to that PMI I showed you, the architect buildings are, are not as strong as they should be. So we're probably gonna have some weakness in construction for a while. So last few slides, so how does Houston compare to its peers? You know, we, we have the sense that because we're oil and gas, we are probably worse off than everyone else. Well, I tell you, that's not true. Uh, if you wanna look at one metric, as far as returning to the office, uh, this is Castle Card Systems. You know, those of you who work in the office, a little card that you have to swipe to get in the office. And about, based on uh, how many people are swiping to get into the office in Houston, uh, about a third of the normal workforce is back, and you can look at other places like New York and San Jose and Chicago, a uh, much lower number of people are reporting to the office there. But another way to look at it is if you just, how far off are we from February of last year, you know, the month prior to the pandemic? We're basically at 92.3% of the number of jobs we had last February. Uh, no one is at 100%, but given everything that, that we're worried about with construction and manufacturing, and oil and gas, you'd expect would be a lot worse, but you can look at LA and New York and Chicago and Philadelphia. You know, these metros you see right here, these are the 10 most populous metros. You know, Houston ranks fifth in population and we rank fifth in total number of uh, jobs preserved. If you want to jump down to that second tier uh, of metros 11 through 20 by population, and you've got some places like Tampa and Denver that are doing better, but you can look at all these other places, Seattle, this great tech hub, or San Francisco, the great tech hub, and we're doing better than them as well. So uh, yeah, we're, we've struggled a little bit. We're actually better off though than a lot of other metros. Uh, that gives me some, some hope, although I'm still a little bit concerned about oil and gas. Um, I feel that things look better now than they have looked in the last 12 months. I know they look better now. You know, we're not quite to blue skies and rainbows yet, but, from where I sit, the data I look at, uh, the outlook is the best it's been in over a year. I mean, we're still got a lot of jobs we have to create, but uh, all the signs are, are turning positive, and we'll see what happens when that pent-up demand gets released sometime this summer. So with that, thank you very much. Uh, just a last plug, we have something called State of Houston's Global Economy coming up May 13th. You go to the Partnerships website, and you can find out about it. 
Chad, I'm going to email you a PDF of my slides. And if anybody would like a copy of the slides, you can reach out to Chad or someone on his staff and you can have a copy of them. So with this, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And uh, oh, that's good. ready to take questions. If uh, you want to ask me some questions and if, if Kayleen and Marcel, if you guys want to turn on my video, you guys can see me as I answer. Yeah, my, I would love uh, to see you, Patrick, I'll be scratching my right? nose. I don't know. I, I think that would be great if we could actually see you now. Uh, but hey, first off, uh, thank you, Patrick. Uh, let's give Patrick a, a good round of applause. Appreciate. It. Yeah. And if our if our tech geniuses can uh, look, there goes Kaylin trying to make this happen. So she's trying to get you up on the screen right now. Unfortunately, they have me on the screen. Um, but uh, if you've got questions, Regina's got a, a microphone. And so let's take advantage of having this expertise with us here right now. Um, Patrick, I wrote, wrote down a few questions prior to your, uh, your presentation. You touched on almost every single one of them. Um, uh, the first, my first kind of question was, you know, do you feel, you know, will we recover all those jobs by the end of the year? And, and I heard, no, that's going to be a three-year process if, if at best, right? Um, 2021 will be the best year for job growth because that's when we're going to have the, all that pent up demand released. And that's when we're going to have the benefit from all the stimulus packages that have been out there. But after a while, the pent up demand eases and the effect that people spend the money in the stimulus packages. And then uh, it starts to fade over time. I think, I, I think that'll probably be a little over three years before we get all the jobs back. Yep. yep. That's what I thought I heard. Um, and again, audience, raise your hands if you've got a question and, and we'll have Regina come around. So in the last slide or set, one of the close to the last slides that you, you touched on, um, one of my questions was, um, we have a lot of partners and companies and activities downtown, obviously with y'all there at Greater Houston Partnership. Uh, and I saw the, the, the card swipe slide about uh, activity in offices. When do you feel, uh, when do you think downtown begins functioning again as a work site? Uh, for people to go and eat and entertain and that, that type of thing. Okay, so I, I'm going to preface this with saying uh, from this, this answer is not official Great Eastern Partnership. This is Patrick Jankowski. I think we'll probably all be back in our office by midsummer. I think you're going to see a gradual easing back, and I think you're going to see the same sort of thing happen with office as a pent-up demand. Uh, everyone's going to I doubt we'll ever get back to everybody in the office 100%. It's gonna be hybrid and you'll probably see a half to, to, to two thirds of the staff in at any one time, but it will reopen. And part of that is figuring out how you reopen. But I think by midsummer, we will be back to whatever the new normal is. Good, good, good. And I know that um, the Greater Houston Partnership just sent out a survey. Uh, this uh, now week. you guys can see me. Hi, everybody. Oh, there you go. There he is. <laughs> but I know that y'all just sent out a survey this week kind of addressing those types of questions about how, how you and your company are going to reintegrate. So he is. Yeah, that, that survey closes out at, at five o'clock today, and we hope to get some insights in that. And we'll be sharing those results um, once we have a chance to tabulate them. Yep. But this is new territory for everybody because you've got one thing where the people will feel comfortable being back in a uh, in a group setting, even after they're shot and wearing the mask, because some people may still be nervous. But also, we are not going back. No one is going back to 100% in the staff at any one time. It's going to be hybrid, and we've got to figure out how to make that work as well. Very good. Very good. All right, one last question. Everybody, raise your hands. I think we have some in the in the audience. Let me let me throw this out real quick. I've heard. GDP predictions for 2021, everything from 3.7, 4.1. I was watching TV last night and someone threw out a number of 6% GDP growth for 2021. What are your thoughts on, on that, Patrick? Too high. Yeah. I, I, I think it'll be somewhere north of four, but it won't get up to five. I think, I think we can see 4%. Uh, it, there is still... You know, the problem is there are too many businesses. There are a lot of businesses that, that close or shut down. I mean, that's one of my concerns with the restaurants is people saying, yes, everyone's going to rush out to the restaurant once the restaurants reopen. A lot of restaurants have closed. And it's, it's just, there's still that unknown out there. But I really think um, 
we're not going to have 6% growth. It's, it's going to be less than that. I, I, somewhere north of four, but under five. Very good. Okay. Regina, I think we've got a question from Terry. Hi, Patrick. This is Terry Crawford. And I'm just wondering if you um, have seen anything internationally or globally that could impact um, our economy. Oh, yes, definitely. Um, in spite of the struggles we had early on in our pandemic and getting the vaccine rolled out, we're actually becoming more and more successful and we're getting more people vaccinated. And the U.S. is going to uh, hit herd immunity long before Europe will and before Africa or Latin America will. And my concern is we need the other economies to open up because they are the consumers of so much of what we produce here in Houston. If we start to see stronger growth in Europe and stronger growth in, in Latin America, that that's going to open up the export markets for us. But until we start to see stronger growth there, the demand for the chemicals and the plastics and the refined products and the engineering services is going to be somewhat subdued. Very good. Okay. We've got some questions online from the chat. So Regina, why don't you pull those up for us real quick? There you go. So one of them uh, is with the large stimulus packages, why is inflation not a bigger concern? Oh, it will be though. Not right now, but it will be. There is a, we were probably going to see a, a, a rise in inflation temporarily associated with the reopening as everybody rushes out to the, the restaurant and everyone is competing for scarce goods until we can get supply back up. Uh, but this, is, this has been a, a, something economists have been warning about because we have not seen inflation over the last when I first started my career, we had double digit inflation. That was 30 years ago. We've seen inflation at 2% now for well, 10 years or, or, or eight years. And so there's this expectation that we will see a surge in inflation, but it's going to be temporary. And, uh, you know, I, I'm right now, you, you, you're catching me thinking on the fly. <laughs> Question, uh, question. I, I, I know what people are talking about with inflation, and I know what Chairman Powell has said, and Chairman Powell, Chairman of the Fed, says he expects any increase in inflation to be temporary before it settles back down. Uh, part of the problem is, is the way they measure inflation. Even though it might not get reported in the headline numbers, there are things you and I are going to be paying more for. Uh, for one thing, we lost the capability when the auto plants were shut down they didn't produce the equivalent of 3.7 million automobiles last year. And so we're seeing a shortage in automobiles and you're seeing prices go up, but that's not part of the CPI. When we see housing the way it is, housing values, single family homes in Houston have gone up. Uh, the ones that are being sold brand new have gone up 15 to 20% in the last year. Resale homes have gone up about 15%. That's not calculated in the CPI. We're going to be paying more for gasoline. Yeah, that will, but then that becomes part of that odd, uh, all things ex except fuel and, and groceries. So I think we're all are going to be paying more, but it's not going to show up in the CPI. Just when my wife and I finally get a chance to take that cruise, uh, and if there are a lot of people competing for that, the cruise lines are going to have their algorithms, and they're going to sit and see, okay, there's a sudden surge in people who want to go on vacation who haven't been. And you're going to see those prices go up overnight. So we're going to see airline fares go up once people start flying more. And so I expect we're going to be paying more, but it's not going to show up in the CPI numbers. Very good. All right, Regina. So another one that we have is in the downturn of 2020, uh, 2008, so we saw some jobs disappear forever. Uh, displaced employees either had to retire or uh, or or um, or leave the workforce. Has COVID nineteen forced a similar impact on jobs and employment opportunities? Definitely, definitely. I, I'm very concerned. I keep on saying, very concerned about the people who lost their jobs in oil and gas. And you see that we've lost fourteen thousand jobs in the last two years. As I talk to people in the industry, and as I talk to other economists and I look at the data, some of those jobs are never coming back, never coming back because of expectations of lower demand 
for, for liquid fuels, for the fact that OPEC has 7 million barrels a day of capacity that it's not using, for government mandates to move the electronic ve electric vehicles. So the oil and gas industry is pretty much plateaued for employment. We'll never see oil and gas employment get back to where it was six years ago, definitely, maybe not even two years ago. So that, that's a challenge. And then it's all the manufacturing jobs that are associated with it. You're gonna even see a loss of, of retail jobs or lower paying jobs, but there's so many. As I go to rest, my wife and I have gone to some restaurants. I walked into my, one of my favorite restaurants and asked for a menu. And they tell me, scan this on the table and the menu pops up on my iPhone. And I did everything off my iPhone. So, and so you're gonna, you're gonna have that technology. It's classic technology replacing things, but technology has accelerated with COVID and that's gonna do away with some jobs. Just telemedicine, uh, the Medicare, Medicaid is more willing to pay for people having visits over telemedicine. That's gonna affect the number of people you might need in the doctor's office now to deal with uh, patients and diagnosis. So yeah, there, there, there will be a significant number of jobs that we need to retrain people for. All right, appreciate it, Patrick. I think that's all of our questions right now, unless anybody else in the audience has one, if not. All right, let's say thank you again to uh, Patrick Jankowski. Patrick, appreciate it so much. Great. Thanks, Chad. I'm going to go ahead and sign off then. Excellent. We'll see you soon.